speaking about the great stellium and the collective psyche. And I'm really excited about this because this topic and these topics uh, were one of the first um, and some of the first, <laughs> this was one of the first things that really got me into astrology and exposed and showed to me the power of astrological research, particularly when you have a computer program and you can really dial in and look at transits um, through the past. And it allowed me to tap into some of these larger cycles that were really instructive and I thought profound. And so I wanna talk a little bit about that today. The great stellium, what is the great stellium? Well, it's when all seven traditional planets are present in the same sign. And in astrology, we have this term co-presence. And so it's when all seven traditional planets are co-present. Initially, these ideas were published in an article that I, that I wrote for AIM Infinity Astrological Magazine. This was published in January, February 2019, issue number 23, and I was honored and privileged to be published by them. And here's the title of the article, The Great Stellium, A Cycle of Planetary Co-Presence. Just to bring it in and bring it down, this is about when all the seven planets are in the same astrological sign. You can see here this first chart. 47 BC, November 14th, you had all seven planets align in Scorpio. And this was the great stellium in Scorpio uh, uh, of that date. The thing about the 47 BC conjunction, so what's so important? All right, it looks cool on the chart. Well, I think there's something even deeper when we start taking a look. So this 47 BC alignment uh, was came almost three years after Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon River, the very famous crossing of the Rubicon. That is so famous that it's now a phrase in our language, right? We, we have this idea of, oh, I'm going to cross the Rubicon. This astrological event timed this very profound and powerful event in the mythology of Rome, which is so important to Western culture and in the life of Julius Caesar. There's only 37 great stelliums that have happened in the roughly 9,800 year period that solar fire uh, allows you to search, the searchable ephemeris that solar fire has available. And it's based on the Swiss ephemeris and the jet propulsion laboratories, you get about once every 264 years, you have a great stellium. If you compare that to the triplicity shift of the mean great conjunction, um, which that happens only once every 200 years. So we're looking at an event that on average is actually more rare than other significant events that we look at in mundane astrology. Now, this is also where I uh, derive the name from. So the great conjunction is when Jupiter and Saturn meet every 20 years. The triplicity shift great conjunction is when they meet in a new element. And um, I thought that was a, a really nice name for this, the great stellium. So Dane Rudyard, amazing astrologer, he's got this idea that the new moon is a seed. And here's a quote from his lunation cycle. The moon communes with the sun to be filled once more with the potency of light that she may be able again to make it a gift to earth creatures. And I really like this um, analogy. And I have here that the great stellium might be considered a kind of seed of seeds for purposes of measuring a grand cycle between the seven traditional planets. You know, and another idea that's important is this idea that contraction can be an initiator. You see it all over mundane astrology. So Ptolemy, when he writes about eclipses, eclipses are a great contraction because it's when the sun and moon meet together near uh, one of the lunar nodes. So you, even in a lunar eclipse, the sun and moon are opposite, but that moon is near a node. And so there's this kind of joining or contracting of the three bodies. By the way, in Ptolemy, the solar eclipse is actually more important because the effects, according to Ptolemy, lasted longer. And so that seeding of the moon and sun, when they also seed with a lunar node, produce these profound effects on the reality. Um, also, the Great Conjunction is a, is a contraction. Jupiter and Saturn contracting. That's then used as a root chart to time events after the Great Conjunction happens. And it's like a coil. It's this condensing, a storing of energy. It's um, around a core and it's used to ignite. And you think about a coil spring. You, you bring this the coil to a small state and then it explodes out. So here's the Great Stellium of 1962, February 5th. And when I started getting into astrology, you learn about this fairly quickly because it's this famous moment. The age of Aquarius is upon us, right? We've heard that in our media and in our music for my whole life. And by the way, you have, uh, what is that? A little over 18 months after this Great Stellium, what happens? Well, JFK is assassinated and an event that still hangs over the collective psyche heavily, that Camelot ended in this dramatic act. And this is in May 2000, uh, all planets lined up in Taurus. And it was 
it was actually this one is kind of more under the radar. Right? Not many people talk about it as much, but I think it's almost even more important in the sense that the lineup of this great stellium, it happens in the year 2000. You remember Conan O'Brien? We have Prince Party Like It's 1999. We have 2001 A Space Odyssey. So there was a lot of cultural markers that were pointing to this moment in time. And you got a new digit in the fourth fourth place, right? In the thousand place, the two, one became two. So it's highly significant symbolically. You have the September 11th attacks um, in New York, which changed everything, was kind of like the fall of the temple, right? Um, it was the um, massive event that completely revolutionized or transformed the consciousness and the scope of that decade and all, everything that happened after that. And I'm sure this will be written about for centuries and millennia to come. This is the thing about those two events, and this is why it's so profound, okay? If you look at the 37 great stelliums, okay, there's going to be one in the year 3,629. I don't even really want to go into that, but there's two great stellium right next to each other, 38 years, two months, and 26 days apart. But the two that we just experienced in the 20th and 21st century were 38 years and three months apart, so just four days longer apart than, this, than the closest two in the whole of the searchable ephemeris. So it's like a double whammy. It's like a combination punch from a boxer. And so you can almost read them together that the, the 20th century is kind of a seed century, that you have these two kind of seed charts combining. The next great stellium actually comes in the 26th century of the common era. Um, so we're not going to see another one for a long time. The thing about the 20th century also is it's a mass communication, mass change, the global population surges. So it's a, it's quite, it's undeniably a revolution in the human experience. The alternative title for this talk was going to be The Great Stellium and the Killing of the King. And I really wanted to go into the idea that the Great Stellium can portend or, or seed uh, the death of a king like Julius Caesar and like the death of John F. Kennedy. If we want to talk about the killing of the king, we need to talk about the Golden Bough. Sir James Fraser, he wrote this tome, The Golden Bough, had many volumes, but he explored mythology and psychology and the collective psyche and the stories we tell. But he has this idea that um, man created God in his own likeness, um, and being himself mortal, he has naturally supposed his creatures to be in the same sad predicament. And so there's this idea that part of our collective storytelling requires these kings to die so we can be and identify with these king-like figures. Um, and he even mentions in the book here that the grave of Zeus, the great god of Greece, who we um, ancient astrologers gave the name Zeus to Jupiter, that people would go to Crete to visit this uh, grave of Zeus for many, many years is this kind of confirmation that gods are mortal like us and they can die too. When a planet is when within 15 degrees of the sun, Hellenistic astrologers consider that planet to be burned up by the sun. They call it under the beams of the sun. And in the Egyptian culture, the planet was actually considered to visit the underworld. And so you had this dying of a planet when a planet went under the beams. In the great stellium and near the time of a great stellium, all planets will be under the beams, uh, either during the stellium itself or you know, in the period, the few weeks before or after, of the great stellium being this cleansing and rebirth of all the six non-sun traditional planets. And maybe that's why we see that mythology sort of uh, being replicated in the reality shortly after these uh, stelliums appear. While we're on the topic of Fraser's Golden Bow, I just have to mention Stanley Kubrick, who famously sent uh, an unabridged version of the text to a studio exec in Hollywood. And that exec replied to Stanley, um, I've got a studio to run. I don't have time to read this mythology. And Kubrick then responds, it isn't mythology, it's your life. And I love this Stanley Kubrick quote, because that's how I feel about astrology, right? It's not some airy-fairy kind of entertainment. This is our lives. I mean, the planets are happening above and inside us simultaneously. If astrology is life um, when we take it sort of most seriously. And I mentioned Kubrick here again because um, he has this film, 2001 A Space Odyssey which it's almost like um, this stellium was prefigured in the cinema and in the culture and people. He probably knew about the stellium. I'm, I'm sure he had astrologers who said, look, May 2000, this alignment in Taurus, maybe this is a significant time. Um, 
But nevertheless, the point is, is that we have these cultural markers that make it even more significant where there was these, this kind of messaging um, of important date, important date. The other analogy I like to use to think about the great stellium is that um, as a family reunion, if we consider the planets to be family, um, that in my article, I talked about it being like the godfather where all the families would meet and make important decisions. And so in the wake of those meetings, um, there's a lot of activity that then leaves a mark and on the collective psyche. I wanna go into this final chart. This is from the uh, 31st May, the year 531, Great Stellium in Gemini. What's so important about it, when I was doing this research, I was like, all right, I've got three here. This seems to be really important. 9-11, the John F. K., JFK assassination, the death of Julius Caesar. And this is the article I found from Time Magazine, Racia Brunner, this is in 2018. Scientists identified the worst year in history because there was a giant volcanic eruption in Iceland. The bubonic plague emerged shortly after this great stellium in year 536. And I was like, wow, this is a direct here. It's kind of like 9-11, apocalyptic. And then I found this, which was at the Battle of Kamlan. Again, it goes back to Camelot, John F. Kennedy. But King Arthur, historians say, died in the year 537 killed by one of his rivals, it's King Arthur, and he's di he dies in this year. So again, we have this theme of the king dying, the mortal king, the great Arthur. The thing that's so important about the great stellium and the events that happen in the wake of the great stellium, and this is in the conclusion of my article, is that they leave permanent marks or they become a permanent part of the collective psyche. So we still talk about Julius Caesar today. Um, Bob Dylan's new record references Julius Caesar all throughout it. You know, Marlon Brando um, acts in the Shakespeare play Julius Caesar 2,000 years later, and we're still talking about the story. It's left a, a mark in the collective. Um, the John F. Kennedy assassination in 9-11, I assume both of those things will last for millennia or a very long time in the future because of how profound they were. They happen in the age of media, so those images will probably percolate and well, well into the future. And so this is kind of my grand conclusion that the great stelliums, they, sort, they kind of open a door into the collective reality and then they allow these narratives to enter that then uh, we use for many millennia to come. All right, cardomancy pull. This is the enrichment card, the three of clubs, sun and Aries, that second decan of Aries. And I think about how we can be enriched by our consciousness being aligned with action. Um, and there's nothing more powerful, this word alignment really comes to mind. You hear it with football coaches a lot where your vision, the action and then the daily plans all come together. And from that space, I mean, towers can be built, castles can be erected, you know, fortunes can be amassed. And the solar consciousness exalted and celebrated and aligned and Mars ruled Aries. I just really think and I encourage everyone to, to sit with themselves. What are you doing every day? Do you want to be doing that? Can you create space to bring your will into your life on a daily basis to start building through those actions um, the life that you want to live and that's the great enriching power of this card all right as always you can book a donation-based reading with me at sjanderson144.com i love to read i look forward to reading for you this is on apple Podcasts, spotify google Podcasts, other podcast players you know check it out there where you like to get audio and you can follow me on twitter and instagram at sjanderson144